Well, too late, way behind, to uh, try to race home and go down. I want to go down the river, but I can't. Ran out of light. These days are just too short, aren't they? And uh, it's chaos in the house. The shop's echoey, <laughs> but the truck's warm, and I'm gonna. I have to get. I got to get all these people's voices heard. And um, so I'm gonna make shares here, and I think. What I'll do on this video is I'll post up, I'm going to put up a whole bunch of cool nature shots that I have video recorded this past year, and um, and what else? What else? Quick note. Um, you know what? When I'm in public, it's kind of amazing how many people come up to me in the public. Everywhere. Gas stations, stores, it doesn't matter where I go. <laughs> it's just people come up. And they recognize me from from here, I guess, and other places. You know, the hunting apps and fishing apps and YouTube. I don't know. And uh, and a lot of people come up to me, which is fine. I got no problem with that at all. But one thing that I have found that is a little odd to me is, I'll bet you nine and a half out of ten people that come up to me don't tell me what their name is and just introduce themselves like people normally do. You know, like for me, if I ever walk into a room and there's somebody in there I don't know, I go straight for them. I look them in the eye and I shake the hand, introduce myself, and make sure they they know they count. And um, so, anyway, it's just a quick note to everybody out there. If you hop, if you happen to do bump into me, see me somewhere, and you want to come up and say hi, you're very welcome to. Just make sure you introduce yourself and tell me your name, because no matter what you're saying to me, I'm just waiting for you to tell me what your name is. And about a lot of people, usually people say like, "Oh, hey, I follow your stuff or see your videos." Holy cow! And uh, I wait for him to stop talking, and then I go, what's your name? <laughs> Give me your name. Shake my hand. And on that note, too, uh, if you do decide you want to come up and say hi in public to me, and if you go to uh, elbow tap or fist bump me, don't come up to me. All right? I don't play those games. You shake my hand. I'm not scared. <laughs> All right? You shake my hand. And uh, that's the only requirement that I have for you to come up and be friends and say hi to me. If you're too scared to shake a man's hand, don't come up to me, all right? There you go. And have an absolute Merry Christmas and a safe Christmas. And uh, I appreciate all of everybody. And I appreciate the friendliness and the kindness of the people here. Um, that's just one of my things. You want to come up to me and say hello, I'm going to make you shake my hand. <laughs> okay? Enough of the frickin' chaos, the craziness. Now, listen to this. And enjoy the video clips that I'm going to put on top of this video. And listen to these, alright? It's very important. Steve, review these first. Four attachments. Three photos and one sound clip, which was much longer. Two photos. Said to be of some subject dead on a gurney type's bed slash table. Tricon 1 and Tricon 2 mislabeled as Tricon should be Tricon. If the label is correct, these are usually dangerous. There are more than one kind we call Bigfoot slash Sabe. A Dr. Miller did several autopsies on this kind. One was found dead under a fallen tree near Cave Junction, Oregon, after the Columbus Day storm of October 1962. A search of that should bring us his story. And the same man had papers sent by Dr. Miller's sister after he died. They indicated that autopsies during his career. I'm sorry. They indicated other autopsies during his career. These two are supposed to be from the USA sometime or another. Equals unknown when. Number one photoed, photo labeled portal. Very recently taken in Washington State by a person who used to look for them due to his own frightening encounter near the Oregon Caves. The photo needs some examination. It took me a while. The portal looks wispy and fluctuating, like a jigsaw puzzle. I was eventually able to see the being in the portal actually appears to be walking out towards us. I'd say about 8 feet tall. Notice the trees behind the glowing as well. The source has put his career on the line as well as his reputation and has also been attacked for his point of view. Finally, in a sound clip, said to be a female singing slash calling to her mate. In the clip, he answers, but I cut out that I cut that out for duration. From same source as the portal, said to be near his previous property. Names given as he gave them. 
Like many others, he speaks of ongoing encounters and mind speak. This clip isn't singing as I know it. And if I would hear such in the forest, I'm sure it would freak me out. His reply I cut for brevity. But it sounded a lot like what many of your contributors report, much deeper and gravelly. I wonder if any of in the know contributors can add tell about Dr. Miller. And that's the end of it. All right, so here's the photographs. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody's possibly familiar with that photograph. And I believe before looking at the photograph, they noted there was a bullet hole in his eyeball or something. Um, whether it's not as it's an actual, um, a real true being, I don't know. It sure looks like it to me. That's a hell of a freaking dummy, faked dummy if it wasn't. Fits the description too as well, doesn't it? Except for the, uh, looks like this has a bit of a neck and not that wide of shoulders. But anyway, uh, the portal, that could be anything. And I'm just, I'm not being a dick. I'm just saying anybody could make that photo today. Whether or not that's legitimate or not, only the photographer will know. But anyway, thanks for the sound. Then I'm going to have to go through my email, see if I can dig this up to find the sound attachment. Because like I said to you guys before, you want to save things to my phone. Uh, I don't know why my phone does not crack open audio or video clips. It just doesn't. It really sucks. But thanks again for tonight in, man. And hopefully I'll get that audio up here too. Now, what's this one? Mark this as red. This is titled, I am Dirk, the son of Daryl Archuleta. All right. Born and raised in Orville, California. I'm, I'm Konkau Madu on my dad's side and Eastom Maydu on my mom's. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. M-A-I-D-U, Maydu on my mom's. When I was a teenager, I would ride the short bus over to Chico Fairgrounds to the Indians to the Indian school called Four Winds. And every morning we would have our own prayer circle where we'd play drums, talk, and sing songs. And we were told that if we were ever out in the woods and found ourselves dangling off of a cliff or in the same or in some other type of peril, that all we'd have to do is sing this song and Satch Moa would come and rescue us. It goes, Yahi Heye, Yahi Heye, Yahi Heye, Ho Hum, Yahi Heye, Yahi Heye, Yah Hey, Yah Hey, Ho Hum. I only used it one time, but it ruined three lives afterwards. I can't undo what happened, and I just shed a tear thinking about it. But I'll get back to that in a moment, because I have to tell you what happened before that. See, I love to go camping up at the Mill Sap Bar, and I enjoy gold panning and just being there because it was a meeting place for our people before the first glass bottle was ever broken up there. We would all meet there before we would go to other gatherings in other states. We would tie the tops of saplings together to mark the trail, and as they grew, they would make a pleasant shady area, and when they were large enough to unknot, the, they would be in a twisted spiral. The ground was also smooth from many years of our stomping the grounds with our bare feet to the point to where you could run and jump and fly without stepping on anything hard, but it has history from a generation of ancestors. It's also where three rivers meet. The first time I smelt that one smell of stank, we stopped at a waterfall on the way down to the campground. I never felt any fear, just the smell. I figured out why they bring that smell around. It's because when you use the woods for a toilet, you dig a hole and bury it, toilet paper and all. And if you pee, you kick dirt all over the top of it so no one else has to smell it. They take a stick and poke it in there, in their litterin, to let you know we are here. If we have to smell it, then so do you, in a way. And I never smelt it after those words. 
Me and my girl would always pick up trash and gather sticks into bundles and then burn them to cook food or to stay warm at night. We'd stop at this one spot where we'd get a pan of dirt and then continue up the river and gather sticks and leave it on a rock for when we were heading back to camp. But one time we stopped and found a perfect shaped heart that was in, a, in the hole where we'd stop and get dirt. It was made by a hand out of schist or a shite. What? It's a soft, shiny rock that you could use for makeup because it smears, but it was smashed into the shape of a heart. We still have it. But you can see the finger indentations of this heart that is not man-made because the amount of pressure used to make it. I'd have to use a press to get the shite not to smear. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. S-H-I-T-E. And there's a bundle of sticks sitting on a rock nearby. I looked at her and she looked at me and we both said, did you put those there? And I thought you put those there because I didn't. Some years later, my sister, who I didn't know, I had come and found... Oh, where dad... Who I didn't know, I had come and found our dad after her daughter came and said, I'm your granddaughter. Because she was lied to by her mom all her life. Well, she was coming down from her place in Berry Creek to visit my dad, and she almost hit a pregnant Saskmo. Satchmo, that was holding a dead raccoon. She said she lifted her leg and grabbed her belly and screamed. And then she had to swerve to miss her. Like a month later, I went up to Millsap alone to try to get my head together due to my foe causing trouble in my neighborhood. In fact, I believe he might have written you a couple of emails in the past. That must mean father. Sorry, that must be a, a spelling typo. He likes to use the phrase punk boy, things like that. Well, anyway, I was driving up to Crooked Bar, which is a mile up the road from Millsap, but I couldn't get there because there was a boulder in the road. So I figured I'd use my come along and move it aside. So I got my chain out and started to wrap my cable and hook around this rock. The next thing I know, I was waking back up or coming out of the darkness and going, what was I doing? Oh yeah, this giant rock. And I continued to wrap the cable around. The next thing I remember was coming to, only I'm leaning against the hood of my truck going, what was I doing? Oh yeah, this boulder. And I know twice the hole in the ground where the boulder hit. I noticed the hole in the ground where the boulder hit. There's some typos, you guys. All right, I got to figure this out. And made mud splatter. So I get out my phone and I'm taking pictures of this spatter. I'm feeling disoriented and I'm rambling on about how I've seen this on Google Earth. Then I see the rock and I go, oh yeah. By the time I notice that it's been an hour and that I still haven't got this cable around the rock. So I go to grab the cable and I hear this voice say, if you pass that rock, we're going to lock horns. And in my head, I pictured this bald white guy, a foot taller than me, with a leather jacket on and, a br and broad at the shoulders. And I thought, I can take this guy. And I said, all right then, come on, let's do this. And I shot my arms out in front of me as if to snap my gi, and I walked past the rock looking for this guy. I get 40 feet up the road, and all of a sudden this acorn comes flying down the mountain from the right of me and lands in the middle of the road. So I pick up the acorn and throw it down the hill to the left of me. And I have to say that the count of 10 or 12, that acorn came down that mountain on my right and landed right back in the middle of the road. I looked at it and wondered, was that for real? So I picked it up, put a mark on it with my nail, and I threw it back down the ledge. And at the count of ten, that same acorn landed back in the middle of the road. So I took four acorns, and I threw one, then two, then three, then four, and each one in the same time landed, one, two, three, four, one after the other, right back in the middle of the road. I was blown away. I don't know why I didn't get it on video. But I went back to the truck, put my tools back, and went down to the bridge. I realized later that he had had a newborn baby, Satch Mo Joe, or Joey, or a baby foot, or whatever you would call it. There's more to the story, but I'm going to stop for now, but I'll pick up where I left off with my next email. Wow. Dirk, that sounds freaking interesting. <laughs> 
the uh, throwing the acorns down the road and having them blast back on the road. That's very interesting, and I'm quite certain there's going to be a handful of people listening that are going to find that quite interesting, too. An interesting part of that email. And I was hoping it butchered up too much, but there's a few typos in that, man. A uh, little bit of spell check when you send in the next one, all right? Make sure you send it. I'm interested to hear the rest. All right, here's another one. Sasquatch in Bellingham and Skagit County, Washington. Hi, Steve. My name is Raymond Francois. I live in Mount Vernon, Washington. Pretty sure you know where that is, just south of you. You can use my name. My my daughter, Nicolene, Nicoline, N-I-C-O-L-I-E-N-N-E, Nicoline, watches you and told me to watch your channel. After listening to you read Edgar's story, my story seems so insignificant, but you always say send your story, and so here it goes. I've been a fisherman in Alaska. I was a logger and a truck driver. I got a couple of stories. In 1990, I was logging for a Gypo Logger up in Bellingham, Washington. G-Y-P-O Logger up in Bellingham, Washington on the Lummi Reservation. It was by the bird sanctuary up there. I was the skitter operator, and I was around 28 years old, and had been crabbing in Alaska in the winter, and then coming back home and logging in the summer. My wife and I only had one car, so I'd walk to the freeway get picked up by Lou. He was the shovel operator. I still remember every day at lunch listening to Paul Harvey, and now you know the rest of the story. The other guy on the landing was Fred. He drove the D9 Cat and was putting a fire break all around the sail which was about 80 acres. Okay, the sale or the site might have been the site. It was getting close to lunch one day, and Lou said, go out and get Fred. I jumped on the skitter. It was a big Garrett eight-cylinder. You could move the world with that thing. Fred was on the west side of the sail, about 400 yards away from the landing. Okay, you guys, so the sail is, he means where they are chopping out the timber. Okay, you guys? 400 yards away from the landing. I got out to where he was, both machines down, and we sat and talked for a few minutes. As we were talking, we heard something rustling about 20 feet in from the tree line. We were right at the tree line. Whatever it was started walking and grabbing and shaking the small pecker pole alders and firs about 4 to 8 inches around. They were about 40 feet high, and you could see the tops of them shaking as it was walking past them. Fred was an avid hunter, and I knew it wasn't an elk, a deer, or a bear right away. He always carried a forty-five with him. I saw in his eyes it was time to go. We started up the cat and the skitter and started back to the landing. He was in the back of me, chugging along, and I could see the trees moving forcefully with us until we got about 100 feet away from the landing. Then they stopped. We mentioned it to Lou, who shrugged it off and rolled his eyes at us. The next morning, Lou and I arrived at the landing before anyone else. We opened the gate that had a lock on it and drove on up the logging road about a quarter of a mile. We got stopped right on the road. There were four nine-foot-long, four-foot-wide circle culverts in the roadway. The flatbed truck had delivered a couple days earlier that we had to put under the road for the streams. They were very heavy. However, now, there was one sitting in the middle of the road, alarming to say the least. We hooked it up with a chain and pulled it off the road, and it was never mentioned again. As the skitter operator, I was going all the way back to the sale to bring in the logs. The tree fellers had already went through and cut 99% of everything down, so I was making my roads and grabbing all the logs and bringing them back. At the very back corner of the sale, there was a little dip. I couldn't back the skitter all the way down and pull the logs up, so I parked on top and dragged the cable and the chokers down, hooked up the logs, and brought them up to the hill and then to the landing I went. As I was down there, I was out of sight from the landing. Trucks were everywhere else. Trucks where everyone else was. Oh, so I'm going to do that one more time. As I was down there, I was out of sight from the landing. Trucks where everyone, trucks where everyone else was. <laughs> oh boy. I felt that uneasy feeling when the hair on the back of your neck stands right up and that primal fear kicks in. Something was watching me. I did not like going to that far corner at all. I went back with no altercations. We're almost done with the sale, and Dwayne, the boss man, wanted me to work on Sunday by myself to bring logs out for Monday. And I told him, no, I don't feel comfortable back there by myself. 
and you really shouldn't be working in the woods by yourself anyway. I had voiced my concern about feeling like I was being watched, but he just rolled his eyes at me, called me a pussy, and told me to get out there and do it on Sunday. Well, I didn't go up on Sunday. I trusted my gut feeling. Monday morning rolls around, and I stood on the ramp waiting for Lou. He stopped and picked me up, so I figured I still must have a job. We got up to the landing, and halfway through the day, Dwayne shows up, and he calls me over, and he says, maybe you should have somebody go back there with you to get the rest of that wood. I said, why? What's wrong? He said that he had come up Sunday alone to get the wood from that little dip, and he had the same feeling I had. He got there and felt eyes on him immediately. He even had a branch thrown directly at him. He never told anybody else, just me. And we spent the next half a day pulling all the logs up out to the flat so that we wouldn't have to go over that edge. You could just feel in your gut that something didn't want you over there. Nothing else ever happened on that sail, and I had forgotten about it for a while until that uneasy feeling happened to me once more. Years later, while fly fishing on the Skagit River up by Lyman, Washington, Lehman, Washington, L-Y-M-A-N, a creek called Grandy Creek, I experienced it again. I used to fly fish there for steelhead, coho, and chums. There's a long gravel bar where I like to fish, down from where the creek comes in. I've seen bear on that bar before. I've seen elk and deer and was never once bothered by anything while fishing. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning, snow on the ground, deadly quiet. The river to the other bank is probably 150 feet away. At that point, the river was low because it was winter and frozen. I just finished walking down the bank, cast my fly rod when I got to the end of the tail out, and I got that weird feeling. Hair standing up on the back of my neck and goosebumps. There was something, not someone, walking straight at me from the other side of the river. I could hear it, as if it was walking towards me, shaking trees that must have been a foot in diameter. A human couldn't do that. I didn't make a sound, but I just kept walking towards the river as I watched the trees moving, and then all of a sudden, they stopped. I turned to my left and stared. I turned to my left and started walking back up the river, up the gravel bar, the way I'd came. I was probably three feet in the water, with my waders on, three to five steps, heading up. I started being followed on the other side of the river. It was pretty thick woods, so you couldn't see in, but it must have been right on the edge of the bank. It stopped as I stopped, almost mirroring my moves. Could have been an animal, I thought. I got about 15 feet, stopped, looked across the river at a big dead cedar snag. that was my lucky spot straight across from me. I got up to where the creek comes in, stopped as there's a little hole right out in front with a big rock in the middle of the river that fish love to hide behind. As I was getting ready to cast, the trees started moving again. Something was telling me to leave and that it didn't want me there. My fear factor was way past 10. There wasn't a sound except for the snowflakes hitting the ground and the river running by. I couldn't make myself cast one more time. I ended up walking back out. I got it in my Bronco and I never went back to that spot again. That was one of my favorite spots ever to fish on the Skagit River, and I never went back. It's been 15 years, and I still haven't been. I tried to go back a few times, pulled up to where I parked, but I could never get out of the truck. Just sat there staring. Same uneasy feeling that I had before. I let that thing chase me out of my favorite spot. I hate it for doing that to me. I've told that story lots of times to my friends, and they always rolled their eyes and gave me that, oh, it wasn't Bigfoot, it was something else, but I know what it was. Thanks for reading my email, and thank you for getting the word out. You do a lot for people. Stay safe, as you always say. Raymond Francois. Raymond, absolutely appreciate your time that you took out to email everyone here through me. All right? And that does suck. You know what? I haven't had a... I'm going to... I mean, I, I I go to a lot of places where there's a lot of experiences from these things, and um, and I and also I go to places where I've had them. Sometimes it's it's not that easy, especially steel fishing. When I'm remote steelhead fishing, I'm I just intentionally stay absolutely tunnel vision, focused on my on my gear and that potential chunk of chrome that's in that pool in front of me, and then uh, I just look, I just stare straight down at the trail at the ground when I hike in, hike out, and. Uh, do my business and leave i'll keep doing it too is until unless something eventually happens one day that blatantly makes me um 
leave and never come back there again. And uh, I got a couple, you know, I remember the stand. I took you guys all to the stand. That place is a place that I don't feel that that excited to go in there. Obviously, when I had those two things beating on trees above me when I was trapping wolves in there years ago, that was very, very intimidating and very, very un unnerving. And I got my hairs on my arms are standing up right now as I'm remembering that. And that was only about two, three hundred yards away from where I had that stand built. And then, of course, the stand was torn down. And um, I just, I'm just not a big fan of going in there, obviously, right? It just doesn't feel right, so I don't go. But I basically forced myself to go in there last spring when I took that trail camera and the meat in there and hung it up and made that video. And then we went back and got that. I say we because you guys came with me. And we got the uh, the trail camera after that. But Yeah, it's a tough thing, man. A lot of people don't understand that. And a lot of people do not understand that feeling that we get, many of us get, when we go to places hunting or fishing or camping, hiking. And then all of a sudden you get that, that overwhelming pressure I call it pressure when you are being stared at, stalked or intimidated. I shouldn't say stalked, stalked. Stalk is when you stalk game to harvest it. And if you are ever being stalked by one of these things, you're not gonna survive it. So we'll just, I guess we'll just call it being intimidated, right? They just intentionally intimidate you and give you a little more convincing to turn around and leave. And um, I wonder how many people have, you know, flipped flipped the bird up and said, F you, I'm not going anywhere. And then possibly um, they are now somewhere where they would never, ever be able to share with us what happened. I wonder if, I wonder if that's the reality. I don't know. But anyway, there's some shares for today. Christmas is getting closer. We have to have Christmas early due to uh, various factors. We have to do our Christmas thing this coming weekend. Should be interesting. And then, uh, and then I got to travel back to the old home and see some people and do some things. And while I'm there, I'm going to collect some SD cards on some of the trail cameras that I can get to in that deep snow. And, uh, and also make some video shares there and get some more voices heard as well. So there you go. There's some more shares again, more people and more people and more people. And I got to, you know, um, a friend of mine said there's a, there's always a friend of mine said there's always people saying what's the email address and various comments on social media are here. So we'll say it again. Info at howhunt.com. No, sorry, it's not info. Tell my story at howtohunt.com or share my story at howtohunt.com. And you can get your experience shares into us that way. All right. And just do it to one email address, all right? Because it clogs up the emails. And it does not get you read any sooner, believe me. Everybody's in line. First come, first serve. Okay, as best as I can. But we're getting there. We're getting everybody heard. I wonder if anybody's actually keeping track of how many emails have been shared on through me to the world so far. I haven't a clue. I haven't counted them. But it's got to be freaking ridiculous, isn't it? Lots of relief there, though. Lots of people getting the respect back. So keep them coming in. And I'll talk to you guys shortly.